Welcome to Online Church in the name of the one true God, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Welcome as we come to encounter the one whose name is above every name. Uh, listen again to the angel's words to Mary, announcing that she would bear a child who would be a saviour. The angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, you found favour with God. You will be with child, give birth to a son, you are to give him the name Jesus. And he will be great. And he'll be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. See, Jesus' name is one of great power. We come to the one who still rules and will always rule. Great power and yet wrapped in weakness, humility. And so as we come to encounter the true God, we encounter the one who meets us in our weakness and lifts us up. So join with me in celebrating that in Mary's words. We say together, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him, from generation to generation, he has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Uh, knowing the name that's above all, uh, we continue to rejoice in God our Saviour. He's come close to lift us up, singing together, My God. My God, full of mercy, heard our weeping, came to bring us home again. the broken and makes them
forgiveness gives me strength to try again. My God takes the broken and makes them whole. Our God knows our weakness and gives us strength. We come to him in dependence. So join with me, let us pray for all people in the church throughout the world. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, has promised you will hear us when we ask in faith. Receive the prayers we offer for your church. Strengthen your people for their witness and work in the world and empower your ministers faithfully to proclaim the gospel and to administer your holy sacraments. Unite in the truth all who confess your name that we may live together in love and proclaim your glory in all the world. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. And we pray for all peoples. Give wisdom to those in authority in every land and guide all peoples in the way of righteousness and peace so that they may share with justice the resources of the earth, work together in trust and seek the common good. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. As we come to remember those in need, we pause. Just a moment that you can bring to the Lord those you're concerned for. Comfort and heal, merciful Lord, all who are in sorrow, need, sickness or any other trouble. Give them a firm trust in your goodness. Help those who minister to them and bring us all into the joy of your salvation. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And for the faithful departed, we praise you, Lord God, for your faithful servants in every age. And we pray that we, with all who've died in the faith of Christ, may be brought to a joyful resurrection and the fulfilment of your eternal kingdom. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Almighty God, who taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending to them the light of your Holy Spirit. Grant to us by the same Spirit to have a right judgment in all things and to always rejoice in his holy comfort. Through the merits of Jesus Christ, our Saviour, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Father, hear all our prayers. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. It's time for the Kids Spot. <laughs> Hey, Gronk, how are you, mate? Hello, Chuck. Sure. Good to see you. Now, I've got some exciting news. <gasps> what is it? We're on Kids Spot. Say hello to the kids. <gasps> hello, kids. Wait, where are they? Just, just there. But I can't see anyone. Maybe if I just adjust my glasses. I think they're there. No, no. Adjusting my glasses didn't work. Oh. Um. Maybe they can see us. Hopefully they can see us. All right, well, anyway, see this word? <gasps> Where did that come from? Uh, tricky, hey? I wonder if the guys at home can read that. Are they seeing anything? Because I can't. Maybe it's... You have to speak up, we can't hear you. My ears full of fur? Or... Mm. No, maybe you'll have to read it for them. They could write it in the chat, perhaps, but you'll have to read it for them, I think. I think it says, Compel. Compels. That's right. If you've been part of Glow at Home and One Online, you've been reading through the Book of Acts with us. And it is a fantastic story, right? Yeah. Yes, it is. Because the gospel, the good news of Jesus, goes out. And we see it starts in Jerusalem and goes out to... All of Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Yeah, and it's exciting as we see the gospel going out. And it's still going out today. Well, in the book that we're reading in church, you'll hear it read in just a moment, and it'll be preached on just after that, we get to see one of the guys who becomes a Christian in the book of Acts. He's now writing to a church that he's planted that lots of people have heard about Jesus, and he's explaining why he tells people about Jesus, why he shares the good news, the gospel. He says it's because Jesus' love compounds. That's right, I heard you. I, I didn't. 
Jesus love. No, guys, really, you're gonna to have to speak loud. We can... oh. Okay, we'll have to do it really loud. Ready? Jesus love compels. compels. That's right. Jesus love compels him. All right, we're gonna look at what that word means. Compels is probably not a word that you use all that often. I don't use it every day. But what it really means is to make or to force, to, to drive. That's why I've got my bike here to help you see what that means. So with a bike, we've got pedals, you've got a chain and your rear wheel. Now, you might know that if you push down on the pedals with your feet, usually not your hands, the rear wheel goes. That's because the chain on the chain wheel at the front drives the sprocket at the back and it compels it forces, it makes the rear wheel turn just as you turn the pedals. Now, a word of warning, don't try that at home. As a kid, I got my fingers stuck in the chain and it really hurt. Maybe some of you guys have studied synonyms at school. One of the more interesting synonyms I found for compel was to, to bounce. And I really like this one. Because if you think about it, if you go down, you're driven, you're forced back up, you bounce go down, you're compelled to go back up because if you don't go back up, well, something's broken, isn't it? Something's not working right. The Apostle Paul says that Christ's love compels him. See, Christ's love bounces him. He's loved by Jesus and so he's compelled. He bounces, he responds by sharing Jesus' love with others. Just like when you go down on the trampoline, you bounce back up. So when you're loved by Jesus, you share that love with others. Uh, each week at Online Church, uh, we're blessed by hearing how God has been at work in different members of our church family. And, and today we're going to hear from Dave. Dave uh, is a member of our Portland congregation. Uh, he works caring for local cars as well as their drivers uh, as a mechanic. Most importantly, though, Dave, you're a follower of Jesus. Yep. Uh, can you tell us, Dave, how did you come to follow Christ? Uh, for me, it was a gradual uh, transformation. So... Um, I remember like hearing Bible stories when I was a child and um, scripture at school and um, yeah, later on youth group and uh, yeah, like I say it's just been like a, a gradual thing that I've grown into. Mm. No, that's really helpful. If it, uh, there are a few people in the world who have a kind of a moment, an instant, a sudden transformation, but for lots of us, it's, it's that process, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, the more we know about him, the more we start following him. Um, Christianity, of course, is not something we do on our own. It's not a kind of solo pursuit. Um, God, God intentionally sets us up to actually um, connect with others, and he gives us the gift of church to help that. One of our values at church is investing deeply in Christian fellowship. Uh, and so, Dave, I was wondering if I could ask, um, how have other Christians invested in you over the years and, and helped you grow spiritually? Um, they've invested in me uh, quite heavily. Mm. Um, so, yeah, like I was saying before, um, you know, the hearing the Bible stories when I was a kid. Um, so that's my parents. Um, scripture, uh, you know, somebody's got to teach uh, scripture. Mm. Um, and yeah, youth group, you know, people have got to young, run a uh, youth group and uh, and just being around Christians. I think that's uh, been the main thing that I've been able to grow as being a Christian Yeah, is uh, having that fellowship. Yeah, fantastic. Um, now that you're older, like you're not a child anymore, you're, you're, you're someone who has the opportunity to invest in others as well as church. What does it look like for you to invest in other Christians yourself as well as them investing in you? Um, I'd say it's probably uh, like your life at church is um, it's not just like on a Sunday. Yeah. So it's every day of the week. Yep. So it's also Bible study. It's also... Um, you know, just seeing Christians throughout the week and uh, doing social things as well. Yeah, catching up, seeing how they're going, and um, and then of course Sunday is is a great day to catch up with everybody and uh, have you know really good fellowship and check in on people and yeah. build them up. So absolutely, yeah, it's great. Yeah, you've tapped in beautifully there, Dave, to to two things, both like. 
there's formal stuff we do, like you know, official Bible study yep. and uh, you know, coming to church. And but there's the informal stuff as well, isn't it? Just kind of getting together, seeing each other during the week, yep. sharing life, talking about what it means to follow Jesus. That's really helpful. Um, it is a complex time where we're still a little while away before we're going to get to meet with everyone again. Um, what are you most looking forward to uh, about when lockdown's over and we can go back to full Christian fellowship? Um, really looking forward to just afternoon tea at church. Yeah. Um, yeah. I really uh, want to hear about what people have been up to and yeah. what sort of projects they've been doing and stuff like that. And uh, also probably barbecue church as well, even though yeah. we're a fair way off from that at the moment. But um, I'm looking forward to that come the warmer weather as well. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It has to get a little bit warmer before that, but there might be a winter feast in between. That sounds uh, pretty good. That's right. <laughs> um, Dave, thanks for sharing that. Uh, you're going to lead us in prayer now, so I'm going to invite you to do that. Thanks, no Dave. Thanks. Let's pray. Lord, we give you praise for your endless love for us. Thank you for our redemption through your Son who bore our sins on the cross. While we wait for our new life to come, when we can be reunited in heaven, we stand ready to follow Jesus. Let us not be overwhelmed by the hardships and trials placed before us in this life, but be strengthened and our character changed to be more like Jesus. Lead us back to your ways and away from the temptations of this world. Help us to get back up again and follow you lord when we fail and fall down remind us that it is only through following jesus that we can be right before you we pray for those who do not know you lord that they may have a chance to follow you also to share in our blessings now and in the life to come help us to successfully share your gospel as best as we can with as many people as we can let us run our ministries as a church well, such as Glow, One, Fresh Food Days, Barbecue Church, and all that we do for you as a church to reach those who do not know you. We also ask you to be with the missionaries sent out to spread the gospel here in Australia and overseas, to give them your leadership to follow wisdom and perseverance to keep doing a great job for you through these challenging times. We especially think of those in countries that are still in lockdown at the moment, with many people working day to day to provide food for their family that are unable to do so now. We pray for those who are in need and hungry. Give our mission partners the means to help them and demonstrate your love in action. Although we are not meeting together physically at the moment, thank you we can still keep in contact with our Christian family using other ways like our online church. Thanks for the blessing it has been while we wait to resume meeting in person again. While it has been difficult to fellowship together at the moment, let it remind us of the importance of fellowship with each other when things return back to normal. In the meantime, we ask that we can find alternative ways to continue having fellowship and build one another up, maybe even learning new ways to fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ from all over the world, a tiny taste of the glorious reunion in heaven we wait for. Before that time, while we wait, we pray for this world and the troubles in it. The world needs Jesus and many do not know your son or have turned away. Help us to shine brightly in this world and give it hope to turn to. Let our leaders make wise and compassionate choices, especially in dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. At this time, let your global church be the light to the world. United together as believers, we are stronger and can build one another up to do good works in your name. We cannot fellowship by ourselves, and you call us to love one another. This is not always easy, but if we remain focused on you, we can do it. 
Thank you for your love and let us reflect it in our lives the best we can. We put these prayers before you, Lord, in faith that you are good and you know what is best for us. Even through our trials, you mature us and grow us to become more like Christ. Thanks for our salvation you give us as a gift and all the things you bless us with. Let your will be done. Amen. speak to a young Christian and say, do you want to know what Christianity is like? Watch me. Do you ever say that? After all, the Apostle Paul can say, be imitators of me, even as I also am of Christ. For all of us do follow people, whether we like it or not, consciously or unconsciously, we do. There are all kinds of things that are learned as much by example as by word. Isn't that why we pray and work to train up Christian parents? It's not just what the parents say, it's what they do. Watch me. So if you're looking around for a good senior mentor, then always ask some fundamental questions. Don't simply say, oh, that person seems to be making a real go of it. Wonderful success. Just love that personality. Like to be like that. No, ask some fundamental questions. You know all about my teaching. Does he follow apostolic teaching, Paul's teaching? How about way of life? Purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, sufferings, do you see? Choose your mentors and then hold the right mentors in high regard. So in a world where there are so many false ideas or deceptive ideas or selfish ideas, un-God, anti-God ideas, what do you do to get orientated toward God himself? Well, you go to his word. You hold on to the Bible. You're not what you think you are but what you think you are. So you need to think God's thoughts after him. Isn't that what Paul says? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And that means you must hold on to the Bible. Not as a magic book, but as a book that teaches you how to think what to think. There is this teaching ministry, whether in our home or in small groups or with our children or one-on-one -on -one across the back fence or around the coffee urn at work, and, and, and then in evangelistic Bible studies and adult Bible classes, whatever, constantly, constantly teaching, preaching the Word of God. How else shall we respond to this world that is going off on its own in other directions? How else will, sh 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 shall we prevail in the last days? We hold out the word to others.
Hi, so I'm Louise and I'm part of the Portland congregation and I'll be doing your readings today. And the first one's from Isaiah 25, verse 6 to 9. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all people, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain, he will destroy the shred the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice to be glad at, in his salvation. Okay, so the second reading is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an internal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. For while we are in this tent, we groan and are burdened. Because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God. Who has given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us. For the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others what we are in plain, in plain, in plain to God. And I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than in what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God if we are in our right mind. It is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's amb ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf. We reconciled to God. God made him who, bad, who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As, God, as God's co-workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain, for he says, In the time of my favour I heard you, and in the day of salvation I helped you. I tell you now, in the time of God's 
favor. Now is the day of salvation. It'd be great if you had opened that passage Louise brought to us from 2 Corinthians and let us pray. Our Lord and Father, we thank you uh, that you're a God who works powerfully by your spirit and word. We pray that you'd be working powerfully right now. Our Father, I pray that you would guard my mouth, that I would only speak truth, and guard all our hearts, that we would delight to hear truth. Transform us by it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's vital you understand the times. Uh, failing to act in line with your situation is foolish, wasteful, even dangerous. Uh, we're shifting to winter. Uh, days are moving from a balmy 15 degrees to... Um, below 10. You know, you fail to understand those times, you know, you keep we wearing t-shirts and, and shorts, you're either a hardened local like Dave uh, or you're cold. Uh, knowing the times, you dress for the day or you freeze in your folly. Uh, I recently arrived at a meeting early. Uh, the, the time came to start and I was still the only one there present. Uh, it turns out I wasn't a few minutes early, uh, I was a week early. Uh, I'd written the meeting on the wrong diary page. Uh, my failure of timing was wasteful. Folly, waste. Currently we live with varying degrees of lockdown. The threat of COVID-19 means it's right we meet as online church and it is unloving to meet in person. You know, failing to recognise the times or, or refusing the truth of the situation can be more than wasteful, more than foolish. It can be downright dangerous. It's vital you understand the times. And 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 puts it clearly. Now is the time of God's favour. Now is the day of salvation. And many are asking, what, what is God doing in this pandemic? Of all the answers we could reach for, 6 verse 2 is about as clear as we could give. Now is the day of salvation. Put another way, um, a way that captures the heart of this passage and our times, God is reconciling in Christ now. We continue our series in 2 Corinthians, a book highlighting God's sufficient grace in our weakness. And Paul is defending the authenticity of his ministry of, of suffering and rejection. Uh, he's defending it to a church he founded in the gospel. See how he spoke about he's trying to give them a chance to take pride in him. Um, and as he defends his gospel ministry, the curtain is pulled back on the essence of gospel work. Uh, you and I get to see what disciple-making discipleship involves. Key is understanding the times, that now is the day of salvation. It is vital to understand the times, to, to grasp what God is doing each and every day until Jesus returns, that God is reconciling in Christ right now. You fail to read the times, you'll be foolish and wasteful. Fail to understand, you risk danger. But grasp this day of salvation, you will live with hope for the future, uh, confidence in the here and now, joy in a purposeful life, and you will wisely use every moment. Now is the day of salvation. God is reconciling in Christ now. And there are three truths that shape the times, three truths to shape your life. The first truth, there is an eternal home. This life is frail and passing. Uh, 5 verse 1 to 10 uh, picks up Paul's confidence uh, from the end of chapter 4. So 4 verse 16, just before Louise read to us, 4 verse 16, Paul doesn't lose heart because his outward weakness renews him inwardly. Uh, his character, his passion, his loves, uh, they, they're all being reformed like Jesus. That's the renewal. And verse 17 and 18, his eyes are fixed on a, on a coming eternal glory that by comparison will make his present sufferings pale. And 5 verse 1 to 10 picks up that idea, takes it further. He longs for an eternal home away from this broken life. 5 verse 1 illustrates it. Now, life now is camping and the new creation with God is a solid home. And this home, 5 verse 1, is built by God himself. That's a way of underlining the quality of it. It's a way of making clear eternal security is the result of God's grace, not your effort. Our physically weak, 
surpassing life is compared to an eternal comfort. Uh, 5 verse 2 adds a metaphor of clothing and nakedness. That is, in glory with God, we will not be exposed, we'll not be naked. Our moral failings won't be on show because Christ will transform his people. Shame is gone. Uh, 5 verse 4 picks up on Isaiah 25 verse 8, our, our Old Testament reading, where God will swallow up death forever and wipe away tears. The new creation will feed on death, gobble it up so it no longer exists, feed on it in a way that makes eternal life even more powerful, even more glorious, strengthening eternity. Uh, 5 verse 5, this, this future is certain. Because right now, the Holy Spirit lives inside every believer. It's there in verse 5. The Holy Spirit dwells in believers as a down payment. So that right now, the Holy Spirit is changing us to be more like Jesus in small ways. That's the down payment, those little changes to be like him. And on the final day, we'll be completely transformed to share Christ's loves and hates and his resurrection body. This life is frail and passing. But thankfully, this life is not everything. There is an eternal home. Now, I'm no camper. Uh, when I camped on uh, Scripture Union family missions, beach missions, I saw it as gospel sacrifice. You know, two weeks living in a communal tent so I could share the love of Jesus with kids on holidays. So that's suffering for Jesus. Um, and I was powerfully shown the flimsiness of tents one year. Uh, our big marquee uh, held hundreds of people uh, it was fixed in place with, with car axles as tent pegs. That's it. It was torn apart in a storm. It was 25 years old. Following year, our brand new marquee, big marquee, was torn apart again by another storm. As old or new, these marquees were still tents. It's the point of 2 Corinthians 5 that this life is frail and passing. Old or young, life storms can destroy they can destroy you. And many of us know that tent-like frailty of life. And when you understand these times, that now is not your home, you're blessed. It protects you from over-investing in this life. Even the most committed glampers don't spend their life savings on tent extensions. No, they put their extensions on the family home, the, you know, the home that weathers the storms. And so in verse 6, 5 verse 6, um, having your heart set on eternity gives confidence in every situation. A little later on, verse 9 and verse 10, um, it reframes your desires onto what you know, can't be lost or taken. An army chaplain comforting a frightened soldier before battle, reflected, read this passage, reflected on this passage, told him, if you live, Jesus will be with you. If you die, you'll be with Jesus. Either way, he has you. Understand these times. This life is frail and passing and God offers an eternal home. Second truth, Christ will judge all. The Lord will judge your deeds. 5 verse 10, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. There is an eternal home, but entry is not automatic. Now is the day of salvation. Coming is a day of reckoning. It will be the fairest trial you'll ever receive, but it will be a trial. It will be just. You know, judged by Christ who sees and knows everything, even the motive of your heart, it'll be personal. We must all appear, it says. All, each of us may receive. No one will be missed and you can't ride others' coattails. It'll be accurate. It's the good and bad you've done or not done. It'll be universal. Even believers Will stand before Christ's throne of judgment. Now, by grace, if you're a believer, you'll be welcomed home. But look back uh, a, a book before, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, read it later. 1 Corinthians 3, you realize you could be saved as through the flames. That is, saved having, having failed to live understanding the times, having nothing of eternal value to show for your whole life, saved through the flames, everything else burnt up. As the English cricketer and missionary C.T. Studd put it, only one life 
It will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. So the prospect of standing before Christ and, and accounting for every moment, every action, every thought is what drives Paul in verse 9 to live to please the Lord. See, the reality is by nature, none of us live to please the Lord perfectly. God has built this eternal home of perfection. And if any person, even a good person by our standards, entered, we'd be bringing in the imperfections that cause death and tears. We'd bring in what God will have to swallow up. No one has the right to enter God's perfection. Whether in large ways or small, you and I, we've naturally dethroned God. We've set ourselves up as opposition, rightly earned his wrath. We've personally offended him. And Christ will judge all one day. Knowing the times, verse 11, it should produce a right fear. See, in many Christian circles, we've, we've grown used to talking about the fear of the Lord as reverence and awe, that, um, that our fear of God is a fear of letting down someone whom you respect, you know, failing someone who's shown you great love, you know, like, like a fear of, of disappointing a loving parent. You know, they, they've loved you so much, so many ways, you want to please them, and, and your fear is not terror, but, but just that you let them down, you disappoint them. Um, it is important we grasp that, that aspect of our fear of the Lord. There's truth in that. But we mustn't lose the other aspect of fear. We mustn't forget what Hebrews tells us. In Hebrews 10, we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, and again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Hebrews 12, worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. The American Puritan Jonathan Edwards preached a famous sermon entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And he compared our efforts to subdue God's wrath to a, to a spider's web trying to stop a boulder from rolling down a hill. And I want you to look again at verse 11, 5 verse 11, and, and listen to Edwards' warning. He preached this, O sinner, consider the fearful danger you're in. It is a great furnace of wrath that you are held in the hand of that God, whose wrath is provoked and incensed as much against you as against many of the damned in hell. You hang by a slender thread with the flames of divine wrath flashing about it and ready every moment to singe it and burr it asunder. And you have no interest in a mediator and nothing to lay hold of to save yourself, and nothing to keep off the flames of wrath, nothing of your own, nothing that you've ever done, nothing you can do to induce God to spare you one moment. Understand the times, and you realise you must prepare for eternity. You can't presume. There's nothing in yourself that can save. I was called to the bed of a dying man. Uh, the family invited me to pray with him just the other week. And I took the opportunity to read with him for, to him from Luke's Gospel and, and read of the thief on the cross. Uh, in that final dying moment, the thief owned his unworthiness, owned his guilt, uh, uh, threw himself in the mercy of Jesus. And in that moment, Jesus guarantees the thief paradise. And I read that passage to this man. I shared the Gospel. I prayed. Now, while this man was still alive and breathing, he was not in a position to make any response. I left him in God's hands. The Spirit is powerful to save in ways beyond our ability. But how late I was called upon suggested that the family presumed he was right with our God and he didn't need to hear the gospel and didn't need to respond. Understand the times. Christ will judge all and now is the time to prepare. The third truth God reconciles in Christ. All are saved who trust in him. Uh, 5 verse 19 picks up God's message of reconciliation to those who will one day stand in judgment. 5 verse 19, uh, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. As God has built an eternal home and now he acts to fill it with the undeserving. God has built heaven and he makes it for you to join him. God reconciles the world in Christ, not counting our record of good and bad against us. 
Now, reconciliation, uh, it can be a financial term. Accountants reconcile the books. They, they make sure the two sets of records match. You know, financially, reconciliation is making sure everything's in order. But the heart of the word is relational. It is overcoming enmity between people. It is removing personal hurt, removing anger, reuniting people who are in conflict. Uh, the prophet Hosea is a powerful image of reconciliation. As a model of God's love, Hosea is called to welcome back the wife who cheats on him time and time and time again. And through personal humiliation, shame, through costly love, Hosea reconciles with Goma. He bears the price. See, reconciliation is personal and reconciliation is always costly and always painful. Now, this week is National Reconciliation Week. Last Tuesday marked 12 years since the Prime Minister said sorry to our Indigenous people. Last Thursday marked 20 years since a quarter of a million people walked across Sydney Harbour Bridge to show support for reconciliation. Uh, Jackie Huggins is an Indigenous woman, a former chair of Reconciliation Australia, and she was asked about the march's impact. And Huggins said, uh, 20 years down the track, has much changed? In some ways, yes, but mostly no. Uh, we still have even worse statistics, speaking of the Indigenous people, we still have even worse statistics in terms of housing, health, incarceration, family violence. Uh, we know the people are there and the feeling is still there. Now we just need that sense of effort. Why haven't things changed? Because it hasn't been done, the effort. It hasn't changed because reconciliation needs more than gestures and feelings. Reconciliation is about action that's always costly and painful. And in Christ, God reconciles the world. He bears the pain so we don't have to. It is the Father, the Son and the Spirit's initiative, not our idea. Have a look again, verse 14. Reconciliation flows from Christ's compelling love. In verse 18, uh, it is all from God. It, all this is from God. Uh, verse 21, the great exchange is made. You know, the, the cost is paid in full, a great expense of God. Jesus takes our place so that we can take his. At the cross, Jesus takes your record of mine. He becomes sin, not just bare sin, he becomes sin. He becomes what the holy God cannot bear to look on. He takes the Father's wrath. He is cast from the presence of perfection so that all who believe can take his record, we can become his righteousness, have his righteousness. We get his righteousness, his record is counted as ours. And it's not just that we're, we're saved from sin, saved from wrath, it's more than that. We are given new life. Have a look at verse 17. Anyone in Christ is a new creation. We're a new creation. It's, it's better than just a negative, the bad thing taken away. We're, we're a positive. We're, we are a new creation. Our loves, our desires, our passions are remade so that we will actually belong in heaven. Not here. And in Christ, God reconciles the world. He bears pain for anyone and everyone. It's for all. You know, the world in verse 19, um, all in verse 14 and 15, uh, that is not every single individual. It is not a, a universalism that means everyone will be in heaven. World and all are ways of speaking about types of people, not just you know, Jews, one nation. God reconciles people from every background, every culture. He reconciles the rich and poor, the healthy and sick, the religious and irreligious, the old and young. But you must respond. 5 verse 20. Be reconciled to God. Be reconciled to God. If you don't trust Jesus for your eternity, if you don't live to please him, you are not yet reconciled. Do not delay understand the times put your trust in christ and be ready for eternity 6 verse 1 don't don't receive his mercy in vain don't hear it and ignore it don't walk away which is what the corinthians are risking doing it's why paul's inviting back take pride in me so that you might take pride in the gospel he says god is saying cry to him in this time of favor and you can enjoy a restored relationship with him your maker and your savior now is the day of salvation God is reconciling in Christ now, and it is vital you understand the times. And there are three quick ways to check you've understood. Three ways to check. First, you long for heaven. 5 verse 8. Uh, 5 verse 8, Paul doesn't have a death wish, 
But his preference, his desire, his longing is he wants to be with Jesus. We Christians don't despise this creation. We love it. We enjoy it. This creation matters so much to God that, that he redeems it through the resurrection of Christ. But we don't overinvest. You aren't crushed when your plans fail, when your dreams aren't met, or when sickness cuts you down because you long for heaven. A British broadcaster, Matthew Paris, had an upbringing in uh, the colonies. You know, South Africa, Cyprus, Rhodesia, Swaziland and Jamaica. But when he went to university, he chose, he chose a university at home. That is England. He'd never lived in the UK. Uh, his parents had no property there. But as a child of the empire, it was home. It was where he longed to be. And the sign that you understand the times is that your heart is to be with Jesus. You long for heaven. There is no, no holiday, no ambition, no family event that would cause you to ask for God's de delay in bringing, bringing you home even for an extra week. You pray, come Lord Jesus, not just in hard times. You pray, come Lord Jesus, in the easiest, best, most comfortable, most joyous times. You long for heaven. Second thing to check for that you've understood, you live to please the Lord. Uh, verse 9. Uh, shaped by both the fear of the Lord and the joy of one day being with him, Paul, Paul lives to please the Lord. A Christian's greatest desire is the applause of the audience of one. It is unhealthy to live for the approval of those who are around you. If, if you're a person who lives for others' approval, you're forever second-guessing yourself. Your, your mood uh, soars and falls on, uh, on popularity. You're crushed by harsh good. It is just as unhealthy to live not caring about any approval. You know, you'll march through life if you're like that, march through on your self-determined course, crushing everyone in your way. But to live pleasing the one, to live pleasing the Lord, that is true satisfaction and freedom. You live that way, you live the way you were designed and redeemed for. Uh, Eric Liddell knew that. Liddell ran in the Olympics and the movie of his life, Chariots of Fire, had him defend his running to his sister. He says, when I run, I feel God's pleasure. Now, whether that's a true quote or not, the, the fictional Liddell understood living to please the Lord is acknowledging and thanking God by enjoying his good gifts. It's not a life of misery. But hand in hand with that, the real Liddell later spent his life as a missionary to China uh, and he was imprisoned by the Japanese when they overtook there during World War II. Uh, Liddell also understood that living to please the Lord was selflessly pouring yourself out in love for others, even at cost. See, the sign that you understand the times is that the approval you seek is Jesus. Whether you're enjoying his good gifts or loving others at cost, it's his pleasure you seek. And the third sign, third way to check you've understood the times, you persuade others. You persuade others. Verse 11, knowing that everyone faces Christ's judgment, Paul, what he persuades, we try to persuade others. Uh, verse 14, he is willing to be thought of as out of his mind for others' sake. In verse 20 and 21, uh, he says that he's God's ambassador. He, that is, he represents God to others. He passes on God's message exactly as God revealed it. He passes it on in the manner and style that accurately portrays God. That is an ambassador's job. Now, he is not Bible bashing. He is not point scoring from smugness. No, in verse 14, he is compelled to share by the love that he's received. Christ's love compels him. So in verse 20, he implores because he knows what's at stake. And my brother-in-law's father, Brian... Uh, passed to glory this week. At his funeral, many spoke. Uh, one was Brian's uh, adopted daughter, Lisa. Lisa's not technically adopted. Uh, Lisa is a Cambodian refugee, the product of a soldier assaulting her mother in a prison camp. Uh, Brian and his wife sponsored her mother to come to this country, and so through tears, Lisa shared how Brian not only invested in her financially and personally, he was the father she never had, but also how he pointed her to Jesus. That is gospel persuasion. It is presenting the truth of the gospel clearly, wrapped in practical love. And the sign that you understand the times is that you seek to persuade all you can of the truth, that there is a heaven, 
We will be judged. Christ has taken that judgment. So be reconciled to him. Persuade. It is vital you understand the times, what the Lord is doing. This is the day of the salvation. Uh, God is reconciling in Christ right now. Let me pray. Our Lord and Father, we ask that in your kindness and mercy you would write in our hearts a deep understanding of these times. Our Father, help us to see that this is the day of salvation, that this life is passing, but there's a, an eternal home waiting for us, that there is a judgment though. Uh, prepare us for that day, but also use us that others might be found prepared for that day too. Father, in this day of salvation, work mightily by your Spirit. Use us well for your glory and save many. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty, through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious life. Forever seated high. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in the virgin birth, I believe in the saints' communion, and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection, when Jesus comes again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. 
As we head into a new week, confident in the one we believe, the Father, the Son and the Spirit. Uh, but before we head off into that new week, do make the most of online chat. Uh, after that, take the chance to catch up with the person whom God has placed on your heart. Two things though I draw to your attention. Uh, first, cap home budgeting. Many are under financial pressure at this time. Christians Against Poverty's home budgeting course is practical wisdom to prevent financial trouble. Uh, we're running it over three sessions from the 11th of June. It might be the course you need right now. Or uh, you may know people who this course would bless. Uh, tell them, offer to do it with them. Uh, do contact Chris Barnett, details on the newsletter, or myself to get involved. Uh, the second thing to bring to your attention is returning to normal church. Uh, we still have no date for when we'll meet together in person. Our parish council are making preparations. We're, we're thinking through safety and spacing and cleaning requirements for when we are able to meet. Uh, but this is still a time for patience as we wait to return to church and patience with one another's different desires and concerns. But we welcome your prayers. And I leave you with these words of comfort and exhortation. Hebrews says, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Keep on loving each other as brothers. Amen. Thank you.